Joe Holiday. So, are you enjoying the day? How many people got to see the rainbow this morning? Wow, that was great. Yeah, and I'll mention more about this later on, but it really pays to look outside. You never know, there might be a whale, there might be a, a rainbow, there might be other things. So it's, it's pretty exciting, even though it's a day at sea, there's still things out here. And you'll hear a lot more about oceanography later on, and so it's great to experience it for a few days before we talk about that. So, as you know, we're all heading toward? Yes, yes. The it's like going to another planet. It truly is special. Uh, friends ask me all the time, why do you work down there every year? You're wasting a whole week, month every, in this year it's two months. And I go, no, no, it's not a waste. It's like going to another planet. It's like being an astronaut. And so we're all, we've got 1,000 astronauts here ready to go. Okay, so part of the, uh, one of the greatest quotes, and I'm going to have you repeat this all week, is you're coming for what animal? but you're going to come back for the ice. All right? It's probably the most famous quote about people who've already been to Antarctica. You come for the penguins and you come back for the ice. Yes. So I want to introduce the ice, uh, everything having to do with ice. And of course, if you have any questions, you can meet us at uh, 4 o'clock up at headquarters. How many of you were there the other day? That was great. I know it was crowded. We had. But it was really a fun, it was like seminar kind of style, and it was good. Everybody had their questions answered. And then, of course, you can track me down. I was tracked down at 6.30 this morning, and I didn't mind it at all. And right in the middle of happy hour last night, don't mind it at all. In the middle of dinner, don't mind it. You know, it's maybe not so good for my um, fellow passengers, but, uh, <laughs> but that was great. All right, so as you can see, there's a lot of ice in Antarctica. All right, this is where we're going, and the places where there is ice, uh, depending on what time you're up and depending on the conditions, are shown in the red dots, and particularly down in Antarctica. But you should, when we're in Ushuaia and other places down there in the Patagonia fjords, you b you'll see glaciers up in the mountains, uh, similar to Alaska. How many of you have been to Alaska? Whoa, wow, that was about two-thirds, three-fourths. Um, so you'll see scenery very similar to that, and so the, the glaciers, the things I'm going to be talking about are up high, you know, a couple thousand feet or thousand meters up high. It's not just Antarctica, but almost all the slides, uh, all the pictures are from Antarctica, because that's why we're all here. Okay, so you've already heard this, but it's worth repeating on probably every talk, is there's a big difference uh, between the Arctic and the Antarctic, not just the spelling, okay? And um, Antarctic means the opposite of Arctic. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, in Latin, okay? And there, it is the opposite. The Antarctica, I as you know, is a continent. We've talked about that many times. And it's surrounded by this huge ocean, the Southern Ocean, this monstrous body of water. And it's isolated, as you've already heard, by the currents. And so it's an icebox. It's the refrigerator of the Earth. The Arctic, on the other hand, is an ocean surrounded by land. And not just land, but the biggest continents on the planet. And so as a result, it's really affected by the land, especially in the summertime. So it's, it's warmer. Antarctica is much what is it? The four words. Colder, drier, windier. And the fourth one is it's higher because of those other ones. It has more ice and it piles up two miles, three kilometers thick. And so it's highest, the highest continent. Okay, and one of the questions when we get down there, one of the most off questions is, does the sea freeze? And yes, it does. And if those of you have been to Alaska, the biggest surprise in Alaska and Norway and Iceland is the sea doesn't freeze because the, the fjords are deep and there's currents, the warm currents. Down here, there's no warm currents. Everything's cold. So the sea does freeze. Everything we're going to see um, down there, when we get down there, <laughs> I'll be on the Shetland Islands, it freezes. It freezes so that Antarctica actually becomes twice the size, if you just count the ice, twice the size every winter. Isn't that weird? So it's, it's, like, a, it's like a 
a plant where it gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. But what's freezing is the sea ice, not the land. The land um, ice is pretty consistent uh, year to year. So you can see that what by the time we're down there at the end of their summer, um, the, uh, we're on the right-hand diagram. February is the least amount of ice, and it's really just those uh, two seas I talked about, and I'm going to talk about again today. There's two seas shown in white in the right-hand diagram. They're the seas that are size of like France or or size of Alaska, and they stay frozen. Okay, so this is what it's like on the frozen ice. You can walk around on it. In fact, at the beginning of the season down here, at the beginning of summer, you cannot push a ship through it. It's uh, it's you know up to six feet thick. That's up to two meters thick, and you, so you could you could drive a tractor over it, and so researchers can drive anything they want over it. So I, I'm not in any danger there. But it's still, it's part of protocol that you carry the pole around and always poke it down just to be safe. So this is what it looks like from um, uh, when it starts to break up. It doesn't just melt like you think of snow, you know, up in the ski areas and up in the northern countries. It starts to break up. It, it's, it melts a little and it breaks up. And so when it's about mm, maybe three feet, one meter thick, it starts to break up on the edges. It doesn't all break up. And it breaks apart, and then they float away, and they melt much faster when they get away from the other thing, uh, other parts of the ice. So that's how it breaks up. And that whole area you saw, the size of Antarctica, breaks up and melts over the course of just three months. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about ice on land, not ice on the sea. The land ice, uh, it's the same you've, if you've ever learned about uh, glaciers anywhere, in the Alps or in the Himalayas or in Alaska. It's the same idea. The snow falls, and it, and it doesn't matter how much snow falls. In a place like Juneau, Alaska, it's 100 feet of snow every year falling up in the mountains. But down here, it's not. It's like two feet of snow. It doesn't matter how much fall, uh, falls, it's how much melts by the end of summer. So here, things don't melt, <laughs> okay, because it's the coldest continent, right? And so the, the snow accumulates and accumulates and it piles on top of each other and first it becomes like granular snow and then eventually packs together like a snowball. Wait, wait, but imagine keep packing it together till it's an ice ball and then you get ice and then as it gets buried deeper and deeper, the, the air is pushed out of it and it gets purer and purer. And so by the time it's down, you know, tens of feet, tens of meter down, it has no air bubbles in it. It's pure ice, purer than most of the ice cubes that we make in our freezers. It looks white, though. You're like, why is it white? Well, the white is occasionally there are days above freezing, and so it melts the top inch or so, top centimeter inch melts a little bit and so air bubbles can start getting in and so it everything looks white but underneath the glacier ice it's actually clear all right so hopefully weather permitting we get to see some ice caps and and they're hard to see in Ana alaska unless you fly over them on places like iceland and norway you can actually see them in the distance they're just this white dome and you're like oh there's one you're lucky to see one the whole week in antarctica the whole place on the on the continent is ice caps and anytime you see any kind of smooth white surface that's an ice cap it's the majority of antarctica okay and you've probably heard this but the antarctic ice cap covering a whole continent how thick two miles three kilometers thick that's 80% of all the fresh water on Earth, okay? 80%. There's like another 20% in Greenland, okay? And where it's thickest is not where we're going. It's that inaccessible area over by the South Pole shown in blue here. And even there, there's even, there's only a few research stations, only like the United States and Russia um, have research stations because it's so high up. It's, it's the coldest place on Earth. So we're going over there to the peninsula, which is shown in red and black there on the left side of your diagram. 
and particularly we're going to the, um, I went up here where the, um, the middle purple dot is, okay, and then over this area, way up here. So that's where the ice is thinnest. Okay. You've probably heard of ice cores. If you haven't, it's fascinating. The study of glaciology, and that's the subject, the, the subset of geology that has to do with ice, is uh, all about drilling down and seeing these layers. Because remember, we have about two feet of snow fillets, and it turns into like two inches, maybe five centimeters of ice. And you end up with these ice layers. And the only way to see the ice layers is to drill down, much like we do this with tree rings. Uh, we can do it with rock layers. Well, we do it with ice. And you're like, why on earth would you do that? Well, we pull them out, spend a great lot of money doing this. We freeze them. We never get rid of these ice cores. They're in a big frozen um, facility. If um, In Antarctica, you don't have to pay for the freezing. You just, you know, just put it in like a cave, right? And the idea is you have these annual layers, and you can look for all sorts of things. One is fascinating is we've discovered when some of the biggest volcano eruptions were. And what it is, you count down, just like with tree rings, you count down and you can say, oh, wow, the Tambora eruption was bigger down here than you know the Mount Pinatubo one, that kind of idea. It's sort of cool. But where it's world famous and it's in science journals all the time now is they're studying the, the little bubbles that are left little tiny microscopic bubbles, we can analyze them and we can date back and we can tell what the CO2 level and other, other gases, but CO2 is the one we're most interested in. CO2, methane, all these greenhouse gases, we can, we can graph them based going back hundreds of thousands of years. It's amazing. Go back through several ice ages. That each ice age happens at about every 100,000 years and we have the ice cores that go back several ice ages. Okay, so all that ice up in the mountains, it does flow by gravity. And you're like, it's solid, how can ice flow? Well, have you all ever played with Play-Doh, Silly Putty, Bread Dough? Those are solids, but you can make a move. How do you make Play-Doh move? You squeeze it, you put it under pressure, right? And if you drop it, which way is it going to go? Down, because it's a solid, right? It's heavier than the air. So the same here, where the ice flows like Play-Doh. It's under pressure. What makes it under pressure? There's no giant hand squeezing it. What's under pressure, it's the, the weight of the ice above it. So the weight, the top 100 feet, 30 meters or so, presses down. And everything deeper than that flows like Play-Doh silly putty, and it flows downhill, and it flows like a river. The diagram on the right is what you may have seen in Alaska, um, or maybe uh, flying around uh, these other mountains like the Andes. This happens to be from Patagonia, the Andes. Um, so these are rivers of ice that flow down. And for every tributary coming in, just like rivers, they have tributaries, every tributary leaves one of those dark bands. So you can see how many glaciers come together to form that when you're on, let's say, South America or Alaska. In Antarctica, there's so much ice, you don't see those black lines very often. And it, so the left-hand diagram is more typical of what you see. Y the, there's still valley glaciers. Some people call them exit glaciers because the ice is coming out of the ice caps and coming down toward the sea. And you can tell because they're cracked. They have crevasses. Okay, so these crevasses are any cracks. In this diagram, we have several sets of crevasses. They can be parallel to the ocean. They can be parallel to the, the glacier. So see how many you can see here. Oops. Oh. Sorry about that. Kim, I need your help. <laughs> Don't you hate? All right, good. No, I, I'm okay. Good, good, good. Yeah. Kim, by the way, let's give a round of applause to our sound technician. We, could, we couldn't do these uh, talks without them, and I, th I think it's really impressive. When you'll hear me, I applaud the most when at the end of a performance, they, up, they, they uh, have you thank the, the band and the technicians. I'm the one cheering the loudest for the technicians. So anyway, so let's try that again. Okay, now I'm afraid. 
Okay. All right, so here we have a bunch of crevasses that are parallel to the ocean because the ice is coming toward us and going over hills. Here the crevasses are seen uh, right down by the ocean and they're often parallel to the, to the, the way the glacier is, that's where it went around the bend. So anyway, the, it, you could just say to your friends and family, oh, it's that bumpy, it's that bumpy landform. That's how you tell it, if it's a glacier that's moving. And the reason they're formed is underneath is moving like Play-Doh, and the top 100 feet, top 30 meters, is not flowing. It's breaking. It's brittle, like ice cubes, like the ice we're used to, and all your drinks that you guys have been drinking. <laughs> okay, it's brittle. So it's the brittle top 100 feet, 30 meters, that is breaking up to form the crevasses. Okay. We're probably not going to see it, but who knows? The amazing things we saw this morning. <laughs> um, and so if you're looking outside a lot and looking for whales or icebergs, you might see this. Uh, this is my favorite thing. It's much more common in temperate glaciers, such as in Alaska um, and Norway and other places you may have been. It doesn't happen here very often. Why? Because the glaciers move slower down here. These are polar glaciers. They only move like one inch a day. Why the glaciers in Alaska and the, in, the, in the Alps and other places, they move about one foot. That's a, about a third of a, s a meter a day. These move, you've heard the expression move at a glacial pace. These are mega glacial pace, very, very, very slow. But when they do come to the ocean, they get unstable and they can break off and it's, you, if you hear something that sounds like thunder outside the ship, not this thunder here, <laughs> that's going to happen probably any minute. Uh, if you hear this kind of sound outside, that might be one of, you should look that way because that's the first thing, it's a thunder sound. The second is this, it looks like the ice is falling slow motion. It isn't. What it is, it's falling 100 feet, 30 meters down. So it's like a 10-story building falling down. And I think we've seen pictures recently of the earthquake to, um, and how, ma how many seconds it takes for a 10-story building to fall down. And it's a similar idea. It falls down. And then the third thing is a big splash that you see in the middle diagram. And that's why we don't get really close to <laughs> um, icebergs, I mean, ice fronts. And you absolutely, if you're like on a kayak or something in Alaska, you have to stay like half a mile away. Uh, kilometer away. And then the last thing, if you're lucky, <laughs> is you see a wave coming across the fjord, the bay, towards you, and that's a tsunami. So it's a four-stage thing, uh, experience, and most, pe most time you don't see all four in, in one event. And we'll be lucky if we just see one. So anyway, you'll have to let me know if you see one. Chances are I'll be looking in the other direction <laughs> or something. So, okay, so four things. Right? The bang, the slow motion fall, the splash, and then the tsunami. So. Okay, once they fall into the water, there's still fresh water, right? That came from snow, that turned into ice, that flowed down, and then the calf. Now they're fresh water frozen in the water. They're in s floating in seawater. And, but it's still fresh water. Uh, the iceberg's drinkable, but the ocean isn't, right? You, you know that difference, right? And so this, but whenever you see an iceberg, they're so beautiful, it's hard to think science. But remember that ice is thousands of years old, maybe tens of thousands of years old, because here in the polar regions. If you've been to Alaska or Norway and other places where you see icebergs, Greenland, maybe the ice is, you've been told, 200 years old. That's the typical uh, number we use in Alaska. But here, because everything moves at a super glacial pace, <laughs> very, very slow, the, you have to add an order of magnitude. So it's like tens of thousands of years old, the ice. So, and as I already explained, the air bubbles were forced out when it was up in the glacier. So this is really pure ice. If you see the white, that's just because the surface is melting. And the, the other thing is these icebergs are unstable. They melt underwater faster than they will melt on the top. Isn't that weird? 
because the water maybe the water is probably colder. It's, it's near freezing, but it, be, it it just melts faster underneath. So these things flip over, and if you see an iceberg that's flipped over, you now have a pure ice exposed, and that's when they get really beautiful. Okay, and if you're if we're lucky enough to have really calm weather and it's not snowing, it's not raining, you, know, you might be able to look down into the water and see what you've heard your whole life, that w what we see is just, there, <laughs> sounds like a calving. Okay, that's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> All right, so we, when you see your iceberg and you take pictures of iceberg, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, and that's where that famous expression comes from. It's just the tip, 90%, plus or minus, it varies. If you have saltier water, if the iceberg's out far from land, it's gonna be saltier water, so maybe maybe it's, it's different. But if it's near land, so it varies, but 90% is much easier to say than 87% plus or minus three, okay? So, and then the, uh, the Number one question I get of the icebergs is, why are they blue? If we're lucky, we'll see bluish icebergs, right? And particularly if one has flipped over recently, let's say in the previous day, you might see a blue iceberg. And ha how many people have ever seen a blue iceberg anywhere in the world? Okay, about a fourth of you, okay. so. And do you remember when you saw it? <laughs> Asking the <laughs> or hearing the, and this is the most misquoted thing, and I, I've been on hundreds of these kind of things, and I've heard people say, the blue ice is because the ice was under pressure. That's only step one. The ice is under, was under pressure when it was up in the glacier. It squeezed the air out. That's the second thing, all right? Then the lack of air makes it pure water. Everybody got that? purer than your ice cubes, pure water. And at that point, it's pure water molecules. It's like a swimming pool or the ocean. And all water, whether it's frozen or liquid, absorbs the red end of the color spectrum. So what's left? If you have the red, yellow, and orange missing, you only have green and blue, particularly blue, right? And so the only, water that only light that comes out is blue. It's the same in oceans. That's why the ocean looks blue from an airplane or satellite. And it's same with swimming pools. Have you ever seen a swimming pool from an airplane? They look blue. They don't look blue when you're sitting next to them, <laughs> but they look blue from up in the airplane. The same with icebergs. But can you get a blue swimming pool if it's like a little kid's swimming pool, only, only a little shallow? No, no. It has to be about 10 feet, three meters deep before you start getting this blue ice. So if you see a little iceberg the size of a basketball or a softball, it's going to look clear. But if you get these bigger icebergs the size of boats and ships, um, and it's, if it's flipped over recently, you can see the blue color. All right, if anybody has any questions on that, ask your neighbor. No, just <laughs> no, no, ask me. I've explained this a thousand times. I don't mind mentioning it again. Okay. Now, something we won't see, but I have to tell you, because Antarctica is like another planet. Uh, the way an Earth scientist views it, and hopefully you'll view it, it's like going to another planet, and what I'm about ready to describe is like going to another planet. And that's the idea of the shelf ice. As you've heard me say, there's two seas here, the size of France or Alaska, Texas, and they're huge seas, and what happens is the ice flows onto them from the mainland. And what it does is it floats, and because of the physics of the, uh, given our size of the earth and the gravity, they end up being about a thousand feet thick. But how much is above the water? Can't say the tip of the iceberg. It's only the top 10%. These aren't icebergs. These are big sheets the size of Texas, the size of Alaska, and they're a thousand feet thick, and about a hundred feet, 30 meters, is above the water. It's hard to imagine. Is that imagine? Uh, something the size of Alaska floating that's a thousand feet thick. This is what a cross section looks like, and they do break off. These are the ones 
that are in the news. You may have heard about the one that broke off uh, a few weeks ago. And when they break off, they're the size of cities. Most of them are the size of cities. You know, it could be a little city like Des Moines, or it could be a huge city like LA, or, or Buenos Aires. That's how big these things are. And occasionally, one breaks off the size of counties, and they make the news. And then about every decade, one breaks off the size of like a state, like Delaware or, or Uruguay or something like that. And they're very, very big. And these things, hopefully we'll see one. This is what I want you to look out for. It may be in the middle of the night. Maybe from your balcony you see one. I don't get to see it. But tabular icebergs are the most amazing things to see down here, other than penguins and whales. <laughs> okay. Okay. And when you come for the penguins and come back for the ice, one of the things you're going to be telling your friends about is tabular icebergs. They're really big. Tabular meaning they're flat. They're, you can land an airplane on them, and they're the size of cities. Largest moving objects on Earth. Okay, they don't just melt. They're too big. I mean, they're the size of New York City or something like that. And they're, remember, they're 1,000 feet, um, 300 meters thick. So it takes them 10, 20 years to melt. As they melt, they get smaller. Sometimes they form an arch. Sometimes they form different peaks. I just, just showed you just a typical one without any of the fancy arches and peaks and everything. So sense of scale, can you see the little boat here? Just for scale. That's just a little boat. This is a medium-sized tabular iceberg. This is many, many years old. It's caught in a, in a, in a bay, maybe Paradise Bay. I'm not sure. OK, money can't, I'm going to translate this into what we're all experienced. Money can't buy happiness, but it can buy you a trip, a cruise, to see a penguin, right? So have you ever seen a sad person who's been on a cruise to Antarctica? <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> if, it, if it's foggy the whole time, maybe. <laughs> but, but yeah, anyway, that's, it's going to be good. OK, here's a few slides of what is going on. Climatologists, geologists, earth scientists. This is what we're hired by. And I'm not just hired by my college, but I've also been hired by National Geographic and if I look familiar to you, because I was on ABC News last year about this. And ABC U News was basically took over the ship I was on. And we had 16 employees and two tons of equipment. <laughs> and I had to carry all that. <laughs> and, and, um, and of course, you wait your whole life to be on TV, and they misspell your name. But on this, on it, the other thing, though, I didn't know where it was. I thought it was just going to be on Good Morning America. And I woke up the next morning, there were 55 text messages. And I thought, oh my god, someone, someone died or something like that. And I started reading them. And by every time zone, there were like 15 or 20 people had seen it on ABC News, and I, which I didn't know. And it was very interesting to, uh, if you look at the date stamp on the text, it w moved across the country. It was really interesting. So. Um, I was their fact checker, so all the facts I'm giving you now, I checked, they double checked with their experts, and they were triple checked by my friends and government agencies because it was being broadcast to 10 million people. So these are all facts that are double, triple, quadruple checked. <laughs> okay, all right. So as you probably know, you're pretty educated people. <laughs> you, know, you know everybody on Earth seems to know this. Um, that the temperature is going up and up and up and up every year. Every year there's news saying we've broken record and everything. And that's shown in the blue line. And you can see it has blips. We don't go by every year. We go by decade averages as shown in the blue line. The red line is the CO2 level. The CO2 is literally off the chart now. It's up to 410. And I need to update my, my chart. And, and and you can see it's going faster and faster, and you've probably heard that, and that's what we're um, um, most afraid of. But we, what we're we're I'm going to tell you, you've already heard all that. What I want to do is tell you about the Antarctica part. 
As you know, Antarctica, the reason it's so cold is it's a continent surrounded by a vast ocean, the Southern Ocean, that I'll be giving a talk about in, um, later on in the cruise, after we've all experienced penguins and, <laughs> and ice and everything. Um, and, but this ocean that surrounds us and makes us colder is warming up, as you can see. And particularly, does, on the, does anybody recognize, can you see maps? What ocean are we talking about here? It's all upside down, yeah. It, between Australia and Chile is the Pacific Ocean, and that's warming up, and, and that's the biggest ocean of all. So anyway, this is affecting Antarctica, and it's starting on the edge and moving in. So let's look at some interesting things here. Okay, first of all, the thing that you can visualize is glaciers. We can take pictures of them. I've had people on the ships that I've worked on where they put the time-lapse photos at these research stations. Like, our, I think this is Admiralty Brown in Paradise Bay, which we may or may not see, uh, but we also put up cameras at Palmer Research Station and all these research stations. There's many of them. There's dozens of research stations along the Antarctic Peninsula, and we can see this, but before I show you any examples, the idea is that when these glaciers get retreat and get thinner, it's the same as if they're in the Himalayas or in the Rocky Mountains or in the Alps, is all that water goes downhill into the ocean. And so that's what we're really afraid of. I'm not, that's not what this talks about, but just keep that in mind, especially if you live in a flat area like, like Florida um, or Holland, or um, you know those flat areas, Denmark. All right, this isn't where we're going, but I just want to show you the that we're even going back in historic records and taking pictures that were taken way back when cameras were newer, little brownies, yeah, you know, hundred years ago. This is a hundred year difference taken from the same place, and we're doing this in Alaska. We're doing this in Svalbard, we're doing this in not so much Antarctica because there's not so much photographic evidence here. This was in the news in the last couple of days. Did anybody see this? I've had people text me this for the last three days. This was all over CNN, ABC, um, Science News, and the, the reason is the researchers at Cornell University decided they wanted their their 15 minutes of fame, and so they, they put it out to the mass media. And what they did is they, this, this glacier is one of the, probably the largest glacier on Earth, one of the top two anyway. It's in West Antarctica, um, and um, not on the peninsula, but near the peninsula. And they sent these um, remote control devices underneath, and they're measuring how fast it's thinning. And this glacier is amazing. Okay, you probably never heard of it. I'm not even 100%, I'm 100% sure I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> All right, Thwaites Glacier has astounding 4% of the sea level rise that have occurred in our lifetime is because this glacier is retreating. And you're like, how could that be? It's huge, it's like 20 miles wide and 100 miles long, okay? And the fear is, of course, if it speeds up, if it were to disappear, let's say in the next century, it, just this one glacier alone, has so much ice, it would raise the sea level two feet. Uh, that's two thirds of a meter. That's, that's bad for Florida, Louisiana. I know we have people here from Louisiana, I've met them, and, I've, and Florida, lots of Florida people. How many of you have been from, from Florida? Okay, yeah, I've met lots of people from Florida and coastal England. There's a lot of people from there and coastal Ar Argentina. We have hundreds of people here. So this affects all of us who live near the coast. Okay, this is why, where it's melting. What do you notice? East or west? East on the west side, yeah, over here near the peninsula. And that Thwaites Glacier is basically the size and location of that red dot. It's big, okay. But the fear is this area here of melting. We're not so much worried about this yet, but you can see it's starting in here. But this is a lot. This is a meter, a, a meter loss every year. Um, it's, uh, and where does all that water go? Into the ocean, yeah. Okay, 
Now, I'm going to switch gears. Make sure you don't get confused. It's so easy when you're talking verbally, like or over dinner or something like that, to when I switch from sea ice to land ice. Now I'm going to switch to sea ice. That's that froze ice that you saw me walking on. All right, and you already heard Tori mention that, uh, and you'll hear her mention again that there's a lot of diatoms that live on the bottom. Trillions, quadrillions of diatoms live on the bottom of the sea ice, and that's eaten by the krill, and the krill's eaten by everything else we care about, the penguins and the whales and everything like that. So we have this situation of where the sea ice is decreasing, and not all around Antarctica, but just where we're going, the Antarctic Peninsula, there's over 40% decrease. Okay, and um, so what ocean is, sh uh, where the decrease is, is shown in white. And what ocean, can you figure that out? <laughs> Very good, Atlantic, yeah. There's some people that can tell which ocean we're talking about. But here in the southern Atlantic, there's a, a marked decrease in sea ice, so that's affecting the krill. And if anybody wants to know more about that, um, I might put that in a future talk, but I think uh, Tori will address that, so I, I won't talk about that. But the krill populations are moving south as a result. Okay, so less sea ice means less plankton, particularly the diatoms, which means less krill, because they eat the, di and then less of these creatures. And I thought I'd put these guys in because you haven't seen them yet. <laughs> and so you all know what a whale looks like, right? <laughs> so. All right, so here's, remember, this is the frozen sea. This isn't the land. This is a different diagram, okay? And this is where the sea ice is decreasing. What do you see, east or west? West, yeah. So all the science, whether you're a biologist, an oceanographer, geologist, or glaciologist, uh, most of our research is on the west because that's where it's happening. And unfortunately, that's where most of the research stations are. So we have a lot of data, a lot of evidence coming in there. All right, uh, every once in a while, this news does get out, and, and as I already mentioned, the shelf ice, I already explained it to you what there was, is that's it. The whole area is the size of states like Texas and, and Alaska or, or you know, uh, France, Germany. These areas, sometimes they collapse, and the collapse doesn't mean like a building collapsing. It means breaking up into billions, billions of icebergs, and dramatically, like all in one year. And this is happening more and more. When it does, it tends to make the news. But a lot of people are thinking, it's just a collapse, it's just falling down like calving. No, no, we're talking about one of these icebergs that holds like 1% of all the ice in the world breaking up and then going out and melting. So if you can see on this diagram, it's hard to put notes on a diagram with lots of white dots, <laughs> okay? So each one of these icebergs is the size of a city, okay? This is 50 miles across. There's the original front. All this collapsed in one year. So this one's about, what, 10 miles? That would be about 15 kilometers across, so that might be the size of your city. That's the size of my city. Actually, I live in a really small city. That's mine, that's mine, okay? <laughs> and so this happens, it's been happening about once a decade, and there's lots and lots of research on it. And why is it happening? It's because the underneath the floating ice shelf, there's the water's warming up, as you saw in the evidence, particularly in the Pacific side, there's the water's warming up more and more. So it's melting it from underneath, and that's what that device that Cornell University was using to look underneath. So more and more research is being done underneath these ice shelves. And when they happen, they are big. Um, as I already mentioned, this one in particular, we name them, <laughs> and they're so big. This one's like named A38 or something like that. And this is one that was like the size of Delaware. And I don't know, that's probably in, in Britain, that would be like the size of Devonshire or something like that. And in um, maybe half the size of Uruguay, if the South Americans. And so these are big. We track them, they're so big, you can land helicopters on, you can land airplanes on these. Um, and they float out, how, do you, how long do you think these last before they melt away? Years? Decades. This one's still, still out there. It's just getting smaller, it broke up into two, 
and then it and, and, and they eventually start going around Antarctica. And I'll mention that in my next talk, the, the route of the icebergs, but I, I, that's uh, too much detail for this, this lecture. I'm just talking about ice here. Okay, the one that was in the news just recently, a couple weeks ago, was pretty small. It was, it was uh, much smaller than Delaware or Devonshire, <laughs> and, but there, it's breaking off. This is happening in annual occurrence. Right, now I'm gonna try to trick your brain. Just the uh, last thing here, I wanna talk about the science, so don't let your brains explode or anything. This is, I promise this is the last thing. When these icebergs break off uh, from the ice shelf, the ice shelf is holding back the whole, the whole mass, two miles, three kilometers. So when a big iceberg like this breaks off, what do you think happens to the speed of the ice? It speeds up, yeah, so that's something that's sort of like my closing scientific thought. I want you, to, I don't want to explode your brain in the morning. <laughs> we got a long cruise to go. We don't want messy brains all over it. Okay, and, but every time one of these icebergs, it, it's in the news, but the news, you know, they gear the news toward like a ninth grade education, <laughs> and they don't want to put too much news, but it's releasing pressure, so m the ice always speeds up behind it, coming down. Remember, it's coming down two miles, three kilometers from, let's, we'll call it the South Pole. And that's what scientists are working on, Earth scientists are most worried about working on it. We have guaranteed funding, that's for sure. <laughs> we don't have to worry about the lack of funding. I've told my geology students for years, if you wanna have your whole ticket paid for, go into climate science, because that's um, gonna affect all eight billion people on Earth. Okay, so I want to close my statement with uh, the thought, you've already heard Tori say this, make sure you're going outside, make sure you're looking outside because you never know what you're gonna see. So today, how many people saw the rainbow? Yeah, that was pretty good. And that was only on one side of the ship. So if there's some phenomena like snow or something, that would happen on both sides of the ship. So if you wanna see rainbows, you have to look away from the sunlight, right? You guys all know that, right? And we even saw, and here's the other advantage of talking to other people. I was talking to several guests this morning at breakfast, and, and one of them just turned to me and he said, have you seen the water spout outside? And I was like, oh my God, I've never seen a water spout. We don't have them in California. Oh my God. So I ran out, and do you know this when you're at, um, up in the cafeteria, what's that called, the buffet? You can go outside, right? And it may be raining like it was this morning, but that's okay. And then they have those slats in the, in the, in between the glass. You can take pictures between the slats. So I got a picture of the water spout with my cell phone. I wasn't carrying our expensive phone at breakfast not much at breakfast to take a picture of, okay? And, but this is the water spout, and I don't know how it comes out. On a, it was taken on a cell phone. It was like a mile, two kilometers away, whatever. But there's amazing things out there. And as Tori said, there, there could be whales, and there are dolphins. Has anybody seen any marine mammals from the ship? Okay, and, and as we approach Antarctica, hopefully we'll see a penguins in the water, you know, there's things to see. So try to look out the window anyway. <laughs> Occasionally, you never know what you're gonna see. And, and then the, the last thing I wanna conclude with here is that one of my favorite quotes is, you may, we are gonna get a rainy day, right? One of these days, you know, Ushuaia or Punta Arenas might be rain, you might go, oh, it's raining or something like that. But remember, without rain, you can't have any rainbows exactly so anyway so hope to see you out and around we're we're a team we have a team here to answer all your questions as we get closer and closer to antarctica it's i'm hoping you're as excited as i am because i'm addicted to it i love this place and i i want to go back every year the rest of my life thank you